Grace asks, what's to be done with all of these shrill and interminable disagreements? Um, when I seem to be online, I seem to be saying all the sensible things about what's going on in Ukraine, and then people come along, say that I'm brainwashed by some kind of Western narrative, and that in fact I don't understand the Maidan properly because it's an American plot, and then I don't understand the neo-Nazi issue um, properly, and then I don't understand Crimea properly. What do I say to these people? Uh, because it seems like these discussions never go anywhere. I think my sense is that very often the particular issue isn't the issue. There's a problem further upstream and you've got to focus on that. I remember there was once a talk um, that one of the greatest living philosophers was giving. He's now in his, well into his 90s. And somebody asked him a question about pain. And the question was, what do we say to people who come from spiritual traditions that hold that pain isn't real? Because it obviously is. But at the same time, if we just say, oh, no, it's real, they're not going to change their mind. So what is going on there? What do we do? And the philosopher said, what they're getting wrong, what they're misunderstanding isn't pain but rather the distinction between illusion and reality. And that's where the issue is. And it doesn't mean that you can talk about that and that'll fix the problem, but it at least mean you'll be able to look more to the source of where this is coming from. I mean, let's take an example. Much of the sort of stuff that you've mentioned, um, especially in the U.S. context, um is very clearly a secondary phenomenon. In other words, people are not really talking about Ukraine. They are making gambits and moves in American culture wars and American political conflict. So let's take an example. The journalist Glenn Greenwald has been very vocal about how he thinks, I'm not endorsing his view, in fact, I reject it, um, how he thinks... Um, that there's a real, real huge neo-Nazi problem with this battalion that everybody talks about and that it's a huge thing we've got to be talking about. Um, and then he says that even though it's such a big issue, what's happening in the US context is that we've got a kind of a dominant narrative that unacceptably... Um, sort of asphyxiates any space for a contrary position. And even if the contrary position is not quite right, that space cannot be asphyxiated in a democracy with healthy discourse, with a profession of journalism operating healthily. Now, about this cultural position that Glenn Greenwald takes, I'm more persuaded, actually. So this is quite interesting, because abstracting away from what's right and what's wrong, there are several possibilities here. One is that Glenn could be right about his culture war position and right about Ukraine. Another is that he is wrong about both. And then he could be right about Ukraine, wrong about the culture wars, right about the culture wars, wrong, wrong about Ukraine. These four positions, basically. And it's very important to see what's going on. And that in itself is helpful. Whether that then leads to a constructive dialogue depends. I think it probably won't, precisely because the issue is upstream. Uh, but I think it would at least be more constructive to, to, to try to diagnose the upstream problem and maybe even talk about that. Because what I would say to Glenn is, I think you don't know enough about this Um issue in Ukraine. Um, I know at least not less than you and maybe more. Make the same culture war point detached from Ukraine. And that'll be a much more constructive conversation. And Glenn will say no, because I am claiming that this particular silencing of discourse around Ukraine is the worst expression of our local problem. And that's why we need to link the two. And I would say, 
well, we're not going to have a successful conversation then because I'm not going to talk to you if you link the two. That's just going to be my personal response. I'm not saying that's constructive, but I'm saying that's part of an exploration that tries to look upstream at what's going on, that what Glenn is really doing when he's talking about Ukraine is he's talking about American politics, American journalism, and so on. And that's very, very important to see. And there is an, an effect going on, and the effect is something like a case of being sort of clamped to the board. And I'm probably borrowing an image from somebody in the uh, intellectual dark web, um, somebody called Eric Weinstein, because with this particular idea of, of his, I, I strongly agree, that in our culture, if you take position A and B, the culture then pushes you to take position C and D, even though you might not believe in them. And that's a real, real crisis. And if you look at really big YouTube channels that are commentating on that culture, nearly all of them are completely lost in this problem. In other words, they really, it, they really shouldn't have taken positions C and D, but for reasons of algorithm, for reasons of audience capture, for reasons of... Um, financial security, financial fears, for reasons of emotional and intellectual insecurity, for reasons of peer pressure, they ended up taking positions C and D as well, even though them being in these positions is a product of all of these forces and not a product of something like a, a sort of more healthy arrival at an opinion, which was the case with A and B for them. And that's why you've got a situation where not just these commenters, but the biggest YouTube channels we have, which comment on our cultures, effectively uh, swimming around in the open water at sea, being dragged around by the current, focusing on not drowning, but in fact not directing their journey in any way, simply as it were in an entrepreneurial way riding out the waves and the currents coming at them without clearly setting a direction. They're lost. They're lost. Some of the most successful sort of cultural commentary intellectual YouTubers are lost. So that's a little bit of um, an answer. Um, but let me add one more thing in case the people who are saying this aren't American culture warriors, but Russians who are in Russia who happen to speak English and can communicate back. I think the big problem with Russia is what Greg Uden, the, the political philosopher, sociologist, often says, and I completely agree with him, and that's that what the Russians have got is a situation that if they acknowledge that the war is unjustified and is a total massacre, calamity, catastrophe. They've got nowhere to go with that acknowledgement. They can't come out onto the street because they will be um, unemployed and in prison. Um, they can't mobilize in any other way politically. They don't see a future beyond Putin. And so the, the problem is isn't that the Russians aren't persuaded of this. The problem is that there is no um, corridor available to them for action on that position, for action on the position, this war is wrong. And because there's no corridor of action available to them, they're not going to take the view that the war is wrong until there's a corridor of action available to them. So the war is wrong, and but now that I accept that it's wrong, I'm able to go in this direction, take a few steps. But if I'm in a situation where I take the view that it's wrong and I have just nowhere to go with it, just absolutely nowhere to go with it, except that every step I take with that view will progressively ruin my life without making my country better, well, then, then I'm going to be terribly motivated in all kinds of conscious and subconscious and unconscious ways to not take that view. So the problem with the Russians typically is that there isn't that range of possibilities. If the situation radically changed in Russia and it felt like the regime was vulnerable and you could take various actions to significantly destabilize it, 
then a great number of Russians would be persuaded to oppose the war. Because the number of Russians who in a very concrete and positive way support the war, in my opinion, is less than 30% less than 30 percent the majority of people who approve of it are people who sort of outsource their political decisions to putin and they would be happy with whatever it, he does whether it's a brutal assault on ukraine or the opposite giving uh, ukraine more territory and giving ukraine compensation they wouldn't accept giving crimea away but that that be happy to give the donbass to ukraine um, and they'd be happy to give Ukraine some compensation if Putin just told them that that's the right thing to do for Russia's national interest. They'd accept that. So the, the, the people who support the war are not really people who support the war. They're just people who outsource politics to Putin. But there's a bunch of folks, maybe 20 to 30 percent, I actually think less, who genuinely and positively think this war is, is, is a good idea. So... That's the problem with the Russians. So I, I haven't solved your problem, but I've spoken in and around a little bit the, the challenge you're facing. Maciel asks, what on earth is going on with this Putin regime being both a mafioso um, gang, but also believing in all of these quasi-spiritual Ruski Mir Russian world things? How could these things possibly coexist? And is it not the case that all of this civilizational, spiritual stuff is just bullshit they've made up because they're a bunch of mafia folk? Um, and if not, what on earth is going on and how does it work? Um, I think that one of the most remarkable features of Putinism, and this will be studied for decades, is that it's this extraordinary blend of criminality and pious, spiritual, civilizational elevation. And a key question arises, is this bullshit or do they believe in it? They believe in it. It's not black or white, but they believe in it is a much more accurate answer than saying they think it's bullshit. I'll name one of the mechanisms that's so strange that's caused this. Um, Putin's civilizational turn, as I call it, I think began to occur when he came back and replaced Medvedev around 2012. And back then, certain stories began to be warmed up in the Russian media diet for the Russian citizens, the Russian population. And these stories were made up, basically. And the early Putin didn't much believe in them and he has come to believe in them more and others have come to believe in them more too so what's kind of happened is that they wrote some propaganda they wrote some made-up stuff and then they ended up falling for it harder than the population they were trying to persuade with it um, that's been a quite extraordinary phenomenon to observe in other words, you concoct a lie, you broadcast it repeatedly, you repeat it repeatedly, and then one day you wake up and you kind of half believe it, and then you believe it three quarters. Um, that's one thing that I think that's worth saying. There are quite a few others, but it's basically an absolutely central feature of this regime, that it's both um, mafia criminal in character as well as being quasi-spiritual, civilizational, moral. And even, I would say, superstitious and even sort of uh, 
interested in the supernatural too um and in the occult um so that's a very very strange very very strange um combination um where you've got some kind of um a local um spiritual guru who happens to be the village thief as well and they're running the show so a question about the west what are your thoughts about the responsibilities of citizens given that we're experiencing uh, problems and democratic decline i'm slightly imposing on the question but that's basically the question um I think that the responsibilities of citizens are different depending on what the citizen is, who the citizen is. So let's take a personal example. Academics, whether they are attached to an institution or not. What's their responsibility? Um, I think it's their responsibility to be extremely vocal about their area of expertise and not to take any nonsense about it but to be very careful about getting out of their lane and speaking forcefully in public about what they're not qualified to speak about um, we saw a crisis of this during the pandemic and the reason we saw a crisis of this during the pandemic is partly because we're just having a crisis of um, loss of trust in expertise in our culture. But there's something specific that happened with the pandemic, and that's that the folks who were meant to be sort of epistemically responsible for the whole show were epidemiologists. And epidemiology, like psychiatry, is a tent that brings together biology, economics, psychology, social science. So there are epidemiologists and there are epidemiologists. And there were very, very, very many people who were speaking totally out of their lane because they knew more science than human science. And there were people speaking totally out of their lane because they knew more human science than they knew science. And this was a glaring problem of expertise. And as a result, trust in experts has declined in virtually all countries following the pandemic. Now, that's about experts. But what about ordinary citizens, um, if we can generalize? Well, I think there are a few things. The biggest one is that citizens should be encouraged and taught to engage in conflict constructively. And that really does mean being willing to sit at the table of politics with people you don't like and being willing to face the fact that you can't divorce your fellow citizens except by emigrating or seceding. And so this is really very important. Keep talking to your political opponents keep sharing a table of politics with them and only leave that table or ask them to leave or ask them to be kicked out if they threaten violence. Unless they threaten violence, you should be talking to them and you should be sharing a table of politics. A table of politics isn't a place where people gather to do kumbaya. A table of politics is where people sit together even though it doesn't feel good, even though they despise each other or they don't recognize each other, they don't like each other. So that's one bit of advice. The second bit of advice is that the only way we're going to recover trust is going to have to be via local level democratic engagement that doesn't displace the basic institutions, national institutions of democracy we have. So we don't want citizens' assemblies that replace national parliaments. Not at all. That would be a catastrophe. But what we do want is local engagement because that today builds trust like nothing else. 
if you have a sense of your community and you live in a mixed mixed community this is gonna um, make the problems of trust better i mean if i am islamophobic and i get the opportunity to talk in the local community in a kind of structured way with muslims that's the best thing for me that's the best thing to snap me out of various prejudices and fears and misconceptions that i have um and also there's a kind of immediacy of local problems and um that means that you are quite ready to face local problems together with people um who are different to you you know if you've got a situation where kids are not safe because we've really got the speed limits wrong in our area and we're working together to change that because cars are zooming far too fast on our local streets um we're going to work on that together we're going to be quite ready to work on that together to make our children safer and so on so that's something else and i think a third thing is to accept the reality that democracy is in decline but that doesn't mean it's going to snap and break and die and that's i think quite different to where a lot of people are and that's the, the panic that democracy is dead or dying or the position that everything is normal and what's wrong is just a series of sort of aberrations or lapses from which we will naturally and organically recover no no, no your, your democracy is actually sick it's not going to naturally recover um it's got a health problem that's not fully curable it's a condition and it needs to be managed and then of course something else that's really important is that you develop a relationship with sources of information you trust and my biggest advice here is to be consistently exposed to people you don't agree with um you might be um, um, very healthily protecting yourself from the unloveliness of social media, except for watching videos on this platform, perhaps. But if you are on a social media platform, like Twitter, for example, a strong recommendation is that you follow people you strongly disagree with. And one of the reasons for that is that it enables you to have the possibility to see where they're drawing their information, compare it to where you are drawing your information. And of course, it gives you the possibility to um, uh, know your opponents and treat your opponents as opponents and not enemies. And it makes you better at engaging in constructive, conflictive um, dialogue with them that doesn't escalate into the sense that you don't want to share a society with them under any circumstance so that's a little bit of an instant reaction but we'll talk in a, in a much more complete and systematic way about this in the future our next question actually i think is continuous with what we've just said so i'm going to be a bit briefer now what's the way out of the situation we're in and that might mean the situation with global politics but let's also stretch it to um, the predicament of democracies in the West. I think we've got a um, crisis of um, political personnel. There is no doubt about that. The, the quality of people going into politics is, is lower. When I speak to colleagues of the older generation who have taught politics or international relations or human rights law or whatever else at universities let's say since the 70s and 80s they all tell me whether it's harvard or oxford or you name it they all tell me that their experience is that um, the number of people in their class who want to go into politics it has shrunk dramatically uh, has shrunk several fold so we've got a real problem um, with quality that's not the biggest problem but it's just one thing we haven't mentioned because we've talked a lot about post-truth on the channel we've talked a lot about identity politics we've talked about how there is a um, a problem on the right um, of 
folks on the right, um, some of them remaining committed to democratic procedure, but others giving up on democratic procedure and giving up so slowly that they themselves don't even realize that that's what they're doing. So I think that from a political point of view, um, in the West, we've got to address the situation of centrist and center-left parties being taken over by identity politics that might actually be kind of depoliticizing, even though it looks so vocally and intransigently political. Um, I do think that the problem with hyper-identity politics is a catastrophe for centrist and center-left politics in Europe and North America. And then we've got this challenge on the right of politics where some folks are simply beginning to give up on democratic institutions. They stop believing in independent courts. They stop believing in the free media. And we've got to call them out. And one problem we have is that folks on the center and folks on the center left or on the hard left often say, well, here the bad right wingers go again. And there's something very dangerous about doing that, especially now, because you've actually got to select the right wingers who are constitutional, who believe in institution and ritual and procedure and actually say, no, 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 you are all together with us here. Um, you know, we're sharing this um, process of cooperative um, conflict together. Um, and these folks who want to give up on democratic institutions, they're the ones who are out, and they're the ones we're going to call out. Um, so that's just a little bit of the problems that politicians face. Um, I think we've then got a situation where journalism is in crisis as a, as a profession, and we're going to talk about that in, in the future. We need journalistic institutions to recover. What is not going to be enough to keep our democracies intact is if we've got many, many brilliant journalists working alone on Substack. Um, that's a world with journalists but no journalism, and you can't have that if you want to be a democracy. Um, and that's part of the story, that democracies are um, reliant on at least some kind of a minimal commitment to truthfulness in discourse. And that requires the institution of journalism to exist. Um, let's say a little bit about the international stage. Um, we have got a crisis of norms on the international stage. And I think that one of the worries about this uh, really bad behavior from Russia is that it's not going to look as bad as it looks now in the future because more and more countries are going to behave like this. Um, and then we're going to have a crisis about what's acceptable and what's not and how we all coexist and talk to each other. Um, and the worst case scenario here is that 10, 20 years from now, we normalize delimited local nuclear wars such that um, we find a way of doing nuclear war without escalating to strategic nuclear exchange and we have several countries use um, non-strategic small-scale nuclear weapons in various conflicts for various partic particular political ends. Um, what we've got to do with Russia at the moment is avoid strategic nuclear exchange while insisting that Ukraine should win and we're going to make Ukraine win. And that's a very precarious balance. And we'll talk more about it. Mika asks, I'm from Finland and I want to ask your opinion about joining NATO. Is there a danger that Russia will interpret the possible NATO membership of Finland and Sweden as aggression that could justify the use of tactical nuclear weapons? Um... Well, let's start at the beginning. Um, you're asking two questions, I think. One is, how do you make your self and your loved ones safe? The second question is, what's the best way for the world to minimize the chances of nuclear war? And it's not evident, it's not evident that the, the answers completely harmonize. So 
let's just throw a couple of things around. I think, first of all, historically, yeah, there has been advantage in being neutral. And it's possible that a scenario will occur in the future where it's more advantageous and safer for Finland to not be in NATO than it is for Finland to be in NATO. But I don't think that's where we are now. So um, this is a very personal question, actually. It's not a, just a geopolitical question. It's a personal question because it's about you being safe and everybody you love being safe. And what do you need to do to make that happen? What do you need to stand for? What do you need to support or lobby? Um, if I were a Finnish citizen, I would want to join NATO as soon as possible. Uh, my attitude would be, please, NATO, tomorrow. Can I do it tomorrow? Tomorrow. We, we're going in tomorrow. So that would be my attitude. Um, and I'm just answering you sort of at a visceral level. What would make me sleep even more comfortably if... I'm a Finn. Being in NATO would make me sleep. I'd probably sleep comfortably without being in NATO. I do think you can sleep comfortably enough in Finland without being in NATO. But um, I'd sleep even more comfortably if we were in NATO. And so that would be my personal answer. At the same time, what would I want if I were an American citizen? I think that if I were an American citizen with a particularly sort of ethically rich disposition, I might just say, well, let's do whatever is safest for the Finns. Um, but if I am a US American with a very pragmatic disposition that I don't care about the rest of the world, I just care about me and my country, then... I um, wouldn't want Finland to be in NATO, potentially. Um, because imagine that a small NATO country not far from Russia is invaded or attacked. What, what, what's... How is it my business to such an extent that I'm going to risk my life here as an American? Do we do we want as U.S. Americans to kill 200,000, 200 million Americans and possibly cause near human extinction? Protecting a small country that's part of our alliance, it's placed not far from Russia's borders. Really? We're meant to die for these countries that we've barely heard of. So there is possible conflict there between Finland's security and U.S. national interest. Um, having said that, a lot of people who are hawkish about the U.S. national interest might actually disagree with what I've said. But I think it's important to, to give the possibility for this perspective that I've put on the table, that uh, Finland might need it, but it might not be the most secure thing for the United States. Then there is something else I would say, and that's that um, today Finland is safer than Latvia, even though Finland isn't in NATO and Latvia is. Putin's much more likely to invade Latvia than Finland. Um, there's no, no comparison even. Um, so don't think that being in NATO guarantees your safety and could there be some kind of scenario whereby it's safer to not be in NATO well that's not how it looks now but you just never know so let's picture that kind of scenario um, Putin wants to test article 5 and Putin is a risk taking man at the moment not at the moment but at this stage in his life and so um he is open to testing the waters. Um, he's not close to testing the waters now, but he, he wouldn't take it off the table. Um, and that just means attacking a NATO country and gambling that 
other NATO countries wouldn't come to its defense. And I think Putin strongly suspects that that's what would happen. Um, but he's also in the mood where if he thinks that there is a 1% chance that a country won't be protected by other members, he won't do it. But if he thinks that there's a 20% chance that it wouldn't be protected, he might do it. He might do it because that's enough of a gamble. One in five, okay, things are not going well for me anyway here. One in five, I'll take it. Um, so in a very strange scenario in which Putin attacks a NATO country and um, NATO members don't come to its defense, hypothetically, let's say that's what happens, well, that's NATO broken to a very good extent, and that's Putin, to some extent, having achieved his strategic goals. If that were to happen, do you want to be in this alliance? That is both, um, as it were, useless at the level of protecting its vulnerable members, um, but also a direct enemy of um, a 19th century Tsar with a nuclear arsenal. So that's what I would say. Um, I, I think that at the moment, in terms of a, a delimited nuclear strike, I think we are quite a few steps of escalation from that. Um, and if it were to happen, it would not affect Finland or Sweden directly. And... Um, and this is me speaking out of turn now because this is not my professional expertise, but m my personal guess would be that no, um, Finland and um, uh, Sweden joining NATO would be taken as an act of aggression by Putin, but it wouldn't be what makes him use small-scale nuclear weapon. That's much more likely to occur um, elsewhere. Uh, for instance, if it were ever to happen, I think it's still unlikely, mm. it would happen um, in a context of some country helping Ukraine a very great deal with weapons supply and Putin attacking some kind of bit of military infrastructure in that country. So the, the sort of tendential answer um, of mine, which you shouldn't trust, is no you joining NATO would not justify a nuclear strike in Putin's mind. Lorem Ipsum asks, could I comment on a thread by Kamil Galiev in which he talks about how so many of the Russian soldiers in Ukraine are, in fact, poor and ethnic minorities. What's going on and do I have any comments to add to this? Um, I think I can say a couple of things. It's very important for Putin to make people in Moscow and Petersburg and a couple of other big centers in the country feel like the war isn't happening. And so you very much want to draw people from other regions. And that's part of the government, as it were, looking after its perceived legitimacy. Because it's very important that as much as possible Russians feel that nothing really terrible is happening. So that's, I think absolutely clear and it means that this war has a very ugly and unlovely ethnic dimension because it's ethnic minorities disproportionately who are being sent into battle to be killed and to kill the second thing i would say is that even more than the ethnic minority component there is a poverty component there um and I think that what we saw in several places, including Bucha, what we're going to see in Mariupol, which is going to be much worse than anything we've seen so far, um, is that um, the ghastliness of the behavior of the Russian soldiers is in some way a reflection of small town life in Russia. Um, both the um, massacres and the, the rapes, but also the theft. I mean, there is even a, a class component here. There's a, quite a bit of class envy going on among the Russian soldiers. 
Um, but it speaks to the poverty, to the cultural dislocation um, and the systemic disadvantage that folks in these towns experience. I mean, we're talking about a country where 30 million people don't live with an indoor toilet, Russia. So there's absolutely an ethnic minority component there that's interesting, and there's a poverty component there, very big poverty component there that's interesting. And the two stories that are important is that um, you don't want families in Moscow and Petersburg having their kids killed, and therefore you focus on remoter regions of the country and then in terms of what we're seeing from these soldiers well we're seeing what the most disadvantaged strata of Russian society looks like um, and they're not in good shape this isn't a question but a response to a comment that's been repeated so so many times that I want to pick it up and the comment basically says that post-truth culture is an old thing and it consists of um, putting beliefs, for instance, religious beliefs, higher than verifiable truth. And that's from um, Andreas. And Andreas, um, like many other people who have written a similar comment, is clearly a highly intelligent and knowledgeable and smart person. But we seem to be en masse getting this wrong. So I want to say something about it because I've seen probably 50 comments with this remark now. Um, Post-truth politics has got nothing to do with lying. Lying has always happened. In some contexts there's less lying, in other contexts there's more lying and these historical phases come and go. Post-truth politics has nothing to do with uh, a situation where we're lying more. To ourselves where politicians are lying more to us that's not it post-truth politics is a situation in which the politician and the citizen co-conspire and agree that it is okay for the politician not to tell the truth that's a big difference that's okay f of a sort of a okay of a nugget for now we'll say much more later alexis asks could we have a world government? And isn't that the only way to solve our problems? Well, I think there are three questions here. One's, will it happen? No. Is it a coherent proposal? No. Would it even be desirable if it were a coherent proposal? No. Why is the answer no to all of these three questions? I think that we're not going to do a lecture here, so let's just jump around a little bit and make a few a points that add some weight here uh, onto the scales uh, and then leave it at that. You know that at the end of the Second World War, there was an extraordinary revolution in international norms and international institutions and perhaps the most striking example of that revolution is the united nations now what do you think about when you think of the un you probably think that it's feeble and you might think that that's a fault of it but it's not it's a feature of its it's a precondition for its existence because the united nations is only allowed to have autonomy because it's feeble if it became stronger it would become progressively less even less autonomous than it is because the major powers the major states would just not let the united nations be both autonomous and powerful so even with a very limited move toward global institutions that the united nations represents we already have a situation where a precondition of its existence is that it's in good part useless. The condition for um, making a proposal um, for a global government um, is that it should be not a moral proposal, but a political proposal. 
What does that mean? Well, it means that it's not enough to say, well, look, what we're doing now isn't working, or it's not working very well. It's not helping us solve the problem of war. It's not helping us solve the problem of the climate crisis. It's not helping us solve the problem of gross inequalities, and so on. Okay, well, let's imagine these observations are all accurate. Um, that's not politics yet. That's just pointing out what's wrong with the world. Politics happens when there is a possibility to tie a complaint or a rejection of our world um, with some kind of a picture of who should positively do what and how and when and by what mechanisms to move toward the destination that you are proposing. In other words, um, just because what we've got now isn't working very well, isn't in any way connected with um, the truth um, that something else will work better. Now, it's very, very important to accept a basic fact about human life, and that's that not all problems have solutions. And just because we've got a very terrible problem doesn't mean that we have a solution for it. Uh, we might, we might not. It's always important to keep exploring whether or not there might be a solution, even if it doesn't look possible, even if we can't imagine it. So this exploration is always possible. Um, but it has to be tethered within a context of practical agency. Who's going to do what, how, and when? Otherwise, we're going to just be, as it were, making an existential or a moral rejection of our world that's going to be unconstructive. Let's throw something else on the table. Um, the most extraordinary evolutionary achievement of human beings is that they live under culture. The fact that human beings live under culture is explained by evolutionary theory. It's not incompatible with it, quite the opposite. But what happens inside a culture isn't explained by evolutionary theory. And even though a lot of... Um, popular um, YouTubers who talk evolutionary psychology or evolutionary biology would like to persuade you that's not the case, they're mistaken. What happens inside a culture is to a very large degree contingent and can't be read off any kind of evolutionary imperative such as um, survival of the fittest. Um, in other words, if we're going to explain why the Second World War started, evolution isn't going to help us. If we're going to explain why um, we had the musical traditions of the blues evolve at a certain point in our fairly recent history, um, we're not going to be able to say, well, this tradition evolved because it served this and that evolutionary purpose. No, that would be a category mistake. Um, so the explanations, the causal explanations that are required are going to be explanations internal to culture. And what that shows is that cultural difference is both explained by our um, evolutionary um, biological nature, um, but what happens inside cultures isn't. And that means that cultures go deep, cultural difference goes deep. And what we've got now is a situation where cultural difference might be so deep that um, multi-ethnic states struggle to get all of their citizens to feel like they're able to cooperate and share in a um, civic order together. Imagine that problem globally. So it's likely to be the case that a precondition for a global government, unless it's a kind of global government which occurs in virtue of the domination of either a single major state or the domination of human beings by machines, um, unless it occurs that way, um, if it's going to occur in a constructive and, and um, fruitful and democratic way, 
it's probably going to have to require that human beings stop living under culture, which is to say that it's going to require that there are no human beings in the world, because this is as central a feature of humans as anything you can imagine. Um, so therefore, a global government is incompatible with the existence of human beings. I think that when you mention, particularly in the United States, so this this is another thing we just you know throw on the table as as a important footnote here. Um, when you mention global government in a culture like the United States, people immediately think of authoritarianism and tyranny. Um, but an even more basic problem is the problem of responsibility and legitimacy. Um, that um, this global govern government is going to have to justify itself, not to just folks in a particular country, but to the entire world. And it's going to have to be accountable to complaints in terms of justice and fairness coming from every part of the world. Well, again, we are struggling inside our societies today in the democratic West um, to persuade people that everybody's complaints and everybody's grievances and everybody's challenges and everybody's structural advantage ma disadvantage matters. Um, and imagine trying to achieve that on a global scale. In other words, um, it's impossible that the degree of responsibility that a global governance requires could be a rational destination for any political agent to move toward. And it's therefore just um, inconceivable that we could find a way to have a global government, a global political authority, that at the same time is reasonably taken to be legitimate but by every everybody in the world. Um, we can't solve these problems of um, it being rational for political institutions and political agents that are currently largely confined to nation states to evolve in that direction because it's going to be about taking on responsibilities that it's going to be irrational for them to take on and there's going to be a real problem of that authority justifying itself. Um, we are having a crisis of trust in the West right now and we are struggling to get ourselves to trust even within nation states. Um, this this is already enough of a problem. Um, and if we've got a battle for something, it's that we've got to battle for um, nation states that uh, endure relatively stably and with peaceful coexistence. Uh, if we can get that, we should be so lucky. And then all the international cooperation we can muster at the level of the states agreeing things between themselves. Um, now, one last thing we're going to throw on the table. Um, human beings do war well. They're, go they're good at war. They have wars all the time. And what that shows is that it's rational for enough human beings and for enough institutions, for enough political agents in the world, enough of the time, to think that um, the imperative for peace is not strong enough relative to other courses of action that might be taken. And we don't have a political solution to this. Um, I haven't answered the question properly, but I've done a little bit of a theme and variations, and we've put a few things on the table to almost just give you a flavor of where I think that um, 
the, the destination of the answer might might lie. Alexis, I hope that's a little bit of, of, of a feedback. Andres, who is the brother of a, a beautiful friend of mine, asks, um, if Putin took MDMA, would that help him become a better person? Um, the answer is actually very complex. Um, but we're going to have to take some kind of a cartoonish nugget and go with it. And let's put our nugget like this. Um, do mind-altering substances, we're going to have to generalize across them and we'll have to throw alcohol into them as well, even though I appreciate that there are certain experiences with drugs that, that are distinct and should be discussed distinctly. But we're going to we're going to be very crude here and say, look, um, when you take stuff, do you become through that stuff less you or more you? What's the real you? Is is the real you the you without anything being put into your body? Or does stuff being put into your body make you more you? Um, I think that Freud's answer was clear, and that's that you become more you. Um, certainly Freud thought that you become more you with alcohol. And it seems to me that the same sort of structure of answer would apply for any mind-altering substance experience. Um, so I think that's the answer. I think that we basically um, would not get a better Putin. Um, and the reason for that is that in the end, I don't think um, you become a better person by taking stuff. Because if you do end up improving your life somehow by taking stuff, that's because you've gone on an exploration with that stuff. It's not because you pressed the button and everything changed. Taking stuff is not a press of a button. There will still be an exploration there. And how you negotiate that exploration will be completely conditioned by your psychopathology. And the psychopathology with which you start this exploration will be conditioning the exploration that you have. So, um, no, we're not going to put Putin on MDMA. Gordon Webster has a question, and it's basically about the relativism of which political systems are appropriate um, where. Um, do you think that grand political visions like Fukuyama's are prone to being blinkered by broader issues of, for example, geography and democracy, and that certain systems flourish better in some places uh, but less well in others? And what um, you then end up with is uh, the clash of ideology and identity um, arises out of beliefs of one group saying to another, look how well our system works here, you should have it there, um, when uh, what they really mean is look at how well our system works here. Yes, there is no question that geography matters. I mean, Russia's geography compared with Denmark's geography, certainly indicates very different things politically. Uh, it indicates different problems the government has to solve. Um, more than geography, the historical experience of a country matters greatly, such that um, whatever happens there has to have some continuity um, with what came before. Um, the idea that is absolutely and definitely wrong is that there is some kind of default form of sociopolitical organization that's sitting there in the glass. And what we've really got is this set of global differences that aren't anything more than just froth atop a glass that we can blow off. And um, 
Unfortunately, much thinking of that kind has conditioned the policies of Western states. And it hasn't conditioned them in the sense that literally at the level of belief, if you took um, the leaders of Western states, that they would be committed to that view. But it's rather that some view of that kind is always there, it still is, lurking under the surface, and it's half believed, it's sort of partially retreated into the subconscious. And it's very much present that underneath, and it might be present in you, in fact, it probably is, that underneath all of these differences, there's a kind of tendency toward liberal democracy, liberal meaning just objective things like a government that you can change, courts that are independent, the media that's... Um, uh, independent. We're not saying anything ideological here. Um, so, yeah, I think that in most people in the West and in most Western political leaders, there is this tendency to think that um, differences, political differences, uh, in differences in political systems across the globe are froth atop a glass. Um, and if you get rid of the froth, you have the sort of um, you know, democratic capitalism, as Francis Fukuyama would have said some years back, revealed below. That's just not true. Um, you can't simply knock a government off its perch via a military intervention, for instance, and expect a democracy to arise. So that's, that's definitely true. But what I think we could do is come at this the other way and say, are there some preconditions for legitimacy in the modern world that really apply to all regimes? And what are they? In other words, um, we know that it's not okay to be North Korea. Everybody knows that's an illegitimate regime. How is it illegitimate? Well, it's simply illegitimate because even if the folks in it agree with the policies of the regime, they agree with the policies of the regime because they are in the power of the regime. The regime has the power to um, terrify them, to cut them off from the rest of the world, uh, to torture them, to cut them off from access to information. Um, so even if that regime has support, it's so transparently a product of power relations as opposed to uh, an authentic position. So therefore, if a North Korean supports a government, they're suffering from false consciousness. In other words, once you remove a few impediments, that clearly stops supporting that regime. So that's clear. But at the same time, it's not clear that every state in the world should look like Canada or Finland. So where do we draw a line? Um, is the line that you've got to be able to get rid of your government, that you've got to be able to have this basic democratic procedure where you can change your government. Is it a precondition of legitimacy that you've got to have at least some semblance of independent institutions, like independent courts, or not? So this is the kind of conversation we're going to have and what I would suggest might be the destination is that some features of Western democracies might anyway be irresistibly part of um, what makes any state that we can genuinely justify, genuinely justify from the point of view of any culture in the world at all. Um, you know, there isn't anybody in the world who wants to be taken away in the middle of the night because they think the wrong thing about their government. So I think that's how the conversation must proceed. But what we've got to try to get rid of from our thinking is this sort of teleological approach where we think that uh, there is this sort of movement in the same direction and we just have to just, uh, in, in a slight way, tilt something or knock something and then the, the democracy will flourish from underneath in whatever country it is we're talking about. That's not true. But it's also not true that... Um, under ideal circumstances, every country in the world should be a liberal democracy or, or it's illegitimate. Um, that 
line might be a little bit more complex to draw. So that's, that's a little bit of the answer for now. Annabelle makes a remark that's not a question, but I'm going to say something very brief about it. Um, Annabelle, if you've caught this, then um, I uh, wish you very, very well, and thank you for writing a beautiful, a beautiful note with curiosity about my views about freedom. I'm only going to say one thing very, very briefly, and that's that we have got to realize that freedom is important, but it's one value among others. And so one of the challenges we're facing, particularly in the West with freedom, is that we've got to understand and explore and be realistic about which of the things we want we should justify in terms of freedom and which of the things we want we should justify in terms of other values. You see, it's very important that just because some kind of a policy proposal doesn't enhance freedom doesn't mean that it's not terribly important. Um, it might even restrict freedom and be terribly important. But one of the problems we often face with freedom is we don't know which of the things we want should be justified in terms of it. So it seems clear that we should justify in terms of freedom your right to not be arrested arbitrarily by your government. That's clear. But what about tackling unemployment? Should that be justified in terms of freedom? People's freedom to have a certain level of living, people's freedom to um, find themselves in reasonable employment, or is freedom not a helpful way in which to justify these things, and should they in instead be justified in terms of solidarity or social justice? And that's, I think, a really fascinating and important conversation, and that's the nugget that I'll, I'll just share for now. Let's take two questions on um, Navalny. One's... Um, What's the deal with um, Navalny's um, criticism of Putin's policies in Ukraine even before this war? Navalny's statements about this war, Navalny's statements about Crimea in particular. Why do they not seem to be statements that carry full condemnation and full um, conviction? I think we've got to... Um, start with Crimea because this is the, cl the clearest case here because I think it's it's available to Navalny to um, fully condemn this war and what's harder for him is to um, say that Crimea belongs to Ukraine and um, that's because if Russia in virtue of some magical transformation, overnight became a democracy and it had an independent media. It had elections and changes of government. It had a, an independent court system that functioned and so on. Um, it would certainly be happy to pay compensation to Ukraine. It would certainly be happy to get out of the Donbass but it wouldn't give Crimea back. Um, a person who wanted to give Crimea back would be completely unelectable in Russia. And so Navalny doesn't have a personal commitment to keeping Crimea. He, he wouldn't personally mind if, if you caught him speaking privately at dinner to give Crimea back to Ukraine. Um, but he knows that that's a completely unelectable position. And so the the most pro-Ukrainian Russian leader in the future would want to erase Crimea's borders such that it became progressively ambiguous whether Crimea was Ukrainian or Russian. And that would be the best you could get. That would be the most you could concede. Um but it's um, not a politically viable move for any Russian politician anticipating uh, 
a future career in a hypothetically democratic Russia 15 years from now. It's not a politically available move to say we're going to give Crimea back. And don't forget, Navalny is a relentlessly ambitious man. He's not a narcissist, but he's a relentlessly ambitious man in the sense that he's um, having his um, water or tea in jail and he'd be asking, I'm slightly exaggerating, how shall I pick up my cup so that the way I pick it up gets me um, 0 0.00001 of an inch closer to becoming president of Russia rather than further away? Every moves, move he makes is about this question. Am I going to be closer or further away from this goal? Which is actually why, even though he's tragically cut off from his partner, from his two children now, um, his health is vulnerable. Um, but despite all of this, um, there's part of him that's feeling really good because his stock has risen so much. His stock has risen since the poisoning. His stock has risen considerably since the war. Um, and that means that while well, he's unlikely to be Russia's president in the future because events and history just wash over things, um, and um, it'll probably be people who aren't yet on the scene who are, who are there ready to take to take power in a democratic Russia of the future, if that ever comes about. But Navalny is um, now, I think, closer to being president than he has ever been, um, which doesn't mean he's likely to be. He is unlikely to be there, but um, it. It means that his stock has risen, the war has elevated his stock. And so he's sitting there partly happy about this. Um, and that's the kind of relentlessly ambitious man that he is. And a man like him would literally need to be totally off, off the wall to say Crimea is being given back. Um, if, he, if he gave up on politics, he probably would say give Crimea back. But that's just not a politically viable move. So another question on Navalny. Um, is there a possibility of an opposition figure to become a spiritual leader in Russia? Um, and could Navalny be a spiritual leader in Russia? Um, I think that what Russia needs above all is a change to... Um, the way the government the governance works and there are two kind of areas of change one is change within the current system in other words whatever processes and institutions are sort of semi semi present today let's get them to work um, that's quite easy to do in other words to get the courts to work in russia all you need to do is just go like that you just need to take the politics out of them um, they will start working tomorrow. So that's a very easy fix. Um, so w whatever institutions are available and sort of semi-functional now, let's, let's get them to work. And then there's a deeper question that you're going to need political reform. You're going to need to significantly decentralize the political system. What you cannot have is uh, to take this in a very crudely exaggerated way, a situation where um, Putin's pro-democratic successor takes Putin's place because then we could just escalate into exactly where we started. Um, so I'm not sure that spiritual leader is, is, a, is, a, is a healthy direction. Um, now, let's change spiritual leader to somebody who carries the population with them. Not just somebody whose critique is accepted, but somebody who carries the population with them. And there isn't a figure like that, but Navalny is the closest. And so what I think you would say is that over half of Russians are sympathetic to Navalny's critiques of the corruption of the system within the country. Um, but most... Russians would tend toward a pro-Putin foreign policy view, less now that the war is going on, but still, that would be the tendency. So Navalny would not carry that much support on foreign policy at the moment. 
um, because he'd be taken to be just unacceptably pro-Western. Nevertheless, um, on top of this sort of 50-60% of Russians who are sympathetic to his domestic critique, there are probably, let us say, 10 to 25% of the population um, who either support or are open to, in a fully-fledged way, backing Navalny. So that's sort of the ceiling of his demographic. That would need to change. That ceiling would need to go up um, for him to become um, even bigger and big enough when the system begins to fall apart to um, aspire um, to lead the country. We've time traveled a whole day and I think there's something missing from this last thing I said about Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader. And that's that it's possible, I'm still skeptical, but it's possible that the upheaval of the war will be so significant, even for Russians who now tend to avoid reality, that they may be persuaded to give Crimea back. So I think it's possible that the war will shake up that kind of um, dead end that I said the issue um, you know, used to take the form of up until the war. Um, I'm still skeptical, but I think now what I've said is certainly at least under question. Alan asks, um, it looks like there is some hope with the younger generation in Russia, looking at the Vox Pop that we're seeing on YouTube, they are coming up with slightly more courageous statements and it looks a little bit promising. And might it also not be the case that mass mobilization will force them to be even more outspoken against the government? And might it not be the case that returning soldiers will also change the atmosphere in the country? Um, you know, in the disfavor of the war. Um, okay. About the soldiers, the answer is no. And that's in large part connected with one of the previous things we've said. And that's that these folks come from very disadvantaged backgrounds, typically um, from remote parts of Russia. And they are not the demographic that's likely to be vocal um, or oppositional. So, of course, there's going to be some anger at the government. And there are going to be angry families who have lost their children, um, who weren't even told they'd lost their children for a long time. But I don't think that's a demographic that's going to create any kind of oppositional way. Now, are the younger generation different? Yes, I think so. If you look at somebody like me, I'm borderline. I went to school for two and a half years in the Soviet Union before my family left and moved to Israel at the end of the 80s. So I'm borderline, but we've now got young people who weren't even born in the Soviet period. And I do think that that makes a difference. I do think that they find it strange that they've got this sort of unreachable monarch sitting at the top of their regime and that the vast majority of the population just seem to be deferring and delegating the business of taking care of politics to him and he seems unac unaccountable, unreachable, out of touch and um, too scared to even use the internet. So, yes, but I think that the younger generation are going to predominantly come at it not from ethical outrage about what Russia has done, but from the vantage point of feeling that they're sufficiently locked in to many bits of globalization, even cultural globalization, they watch American shows. Um, that for that to be taken away from 
them or for that to be stigmatized is a kind of upset over their everydayness that could never seem justified to them. And the more um, the regime goes about shutting the internet, the more they're going to feel like that. YouTube is still working in Russia, partly because the regime knows how impactful it would be to close it. But um, they could close it, and if they close it, then young people are not going to feel that there is any justification for that that they could possibly accept. Um, mass mobilization. I think that... Um, at the moment, most experts seem to say that mass mobilization as such is unlikely. And even if we're going to get it, we're going to move there by increments. So as we've said before, Russia is a country with kind of pointillistic practices of authoritarianism, now pointillistic practices of totalitarianism. And so we're going to have a little bit of pointillistic mobilization, perhaps too, where they're going to mobilize here and there, but it's not going to feel like a sort of a, a, a blank um, rule that simply um, mobilizes the entire population. That's not going to be... I think the way it proceeds is going to probably proceed in increments and partially. How does a depoliticized population generate so much support, asks Motless. And I think this is a great question because it goes to the heart of the nature of the Russian regime. And so when we look at Russian polls, and it says it's 72, 2%, 65% of Russians support the war, 80% of Russians support the war. They don't. I mean, they just don't. What they are doing is they're saying that we are okay up until things get really extreme in their experience to just delegate politics to Putin. And the time might come when they need to raise their hand and say, oh, this is so out of control that we're no longer ready to delegate politics to you. But what needs to happen for that to occur, it's not clear. And so the support isn't for the war as such. The support is um, a kind of outsourcing of political responsibility to Putin. And he can do what he likes so long as minimal conditions of us being left alone and minimal conditions of subsistence are met in our lives. And when that's put into question, then we might reassess this business of um, outsourcing um, all of our politics to this unreachable monarch. So basically, if Putin had done the opposite of the war, had made um, some radical concessions to Ukraine before the war, that had been virtually as popular as the invasion. Because what they're really doing is outsourcing politics to Putin, as opposed to thinking, my word, I want Ukraine to be invaded. I mean, the number of Russians before the war who wanted Ukraine to be invaded would be less than 10%. It's more now, but it would have been less than 10% then. Uh, who would have supported a full invasion of Ukraine, which is what we saw. And now a question about genocide. Can we talk about whether it's Putin's goal and desire to make genocide in Ukraine? And what does the history of Russification and Russian cultural imperialism help us say here? I think that it's clearly the case that a genocide isn't just a crime against humanity. A genocide is something specific. It's a certain group being picked up in virtue of it having certain characteristics that are wrongly ascribed to it. And the reason that that's special is because genocide is an attack on the very idea of 
morality. You see, just killing a thousand random people isn't an attack on morality itself. It's just an attack on these people. But genocide is an attack on morality because it says that, look, yes, we're supposed to have this situation where all humans have equal moral worth, which is the most elementary ethical disposition of the modern world. But we've found this group that's an exception and that doesn't deserve the same kind of inclusion in the human moral umbrella. And that's an attack on the inclusion of some human beings in any kind of moral picture at all. And I think that that is a special feature of genocide. And that is why genocide is always shocking to us beyond the human catastrophe of a particular number of lives being lost. I think one of the things that Timothy Schneider has brought out is that there has been language conducive to genocidal ideas coming out of bits of the Russian regime, bits of the propaganda machine, language that's divided Ukrainians into proper or improper Ukrainians, or language that just said that all Ukrainians are improper and that they can only become proper if they become basically Russian, and if they don't, then, well, they don't matter, um, or they even more positively put, don't need to exist. So there certainly have been echoes of this, and that's always a concern. And there isn't any doubt that these sorts of ideas have played a role in the massacres we've seen in Ukraine. In other words, this idea of denazification has really amounted to some idea that there are proper and improper Ukrainians, and some idea of, as it were, cleansing Ukraine of the wrong kind of Ukrainians. Now, um, I think that if the Russian military success had been greater than it proved to be, um, then there certainly was a risk of um, seeing some of what we saw in Bucha on a much, much, much bigger scale. Um, I don't see anything that would would rule out that as uh, something that could have happened under different circumstances. So just a remark or two for now about genocide. Next question comes from um, SS Henda, and it's a question and a request. Can you attach some kind of link with Jeffrey Sachs talking about his perspective on the war? As you've said that Jeffrey Sachs makes a case that's similar to Merschheimer and to some degree because Chomsky's position is more nuanced, similar to Chomsky. Um, but you've said that Jeffrey Sachs Max makes the case better. So can you attach a link of some kind? I'll have a go attaching something. And then can you debunk the arguments made by Mearsheim or the arguments made by Posner in the video? I might do that, yes. I might do a little episode about Noam Chomsky's views, because I think Chomsky has been much more nuanced than Mearsheim. Um... What I'll say for now is that we've seen two things go wrong with these views. The first thing that's gone wrong is that these views have misrepresented the escalatory intent of the Kremlin or of Putin, of Putin plus the Russian political system. And the misunderstanding is that Putin has two or three very concrete goals in Ukraine. He is either going to achieve them, or if he can't, he'll try to partially achieve them. And therefore, we can negotiate about all of this. But, you see, if you think that Putin is engaged in an existential struggle against the um, international order that's far beyond Ukraine, a struggle in which he doesn't even recognize that Ukraine is real, talking about um, 
dialoguing our way out of this situation is just an elementary misunderstanding of Kremlin intent. And I think all three people we've mentioned have been guilty of this. The other thing that's often missed by these folks is that um, Ukraine has got an anti-colonial movement um, that's been developing over quite some years now and it's it's come to full fruition during this invasion and therefore talking about how ukraine should defend itself against russia isn't some kind of a pious moral position that's a kind of an echo of a world as it might be that's not really realistic for the world as it is it's just an elementary statement of motivational fact and so when we hear voices about how Ukraine shouldn't be encouraged to defend itself, they're simply completely out of touch with reality on the ground in Ukraine. And that's that even the more pro-Russian Ukrainians are experiencing the Russian invasion as a kind of um, shocking and traumatic reenactment of the fascist invasion of 1941. And now we've got a few nuclear questions. Um, will Putin strike the UK with nuclear weapons? Well, no, not out of the blue. Um, will Putin commence nuclear war against Europe and the US? No, not out of the blue. That would require several steps of escalation. Mm, is Putin um, going to use other levels of escalation before resorting to nuclear weapons? Yeah. If and when Putin does go nuclear, does the magic of throwing around nuclear threats become greater or diminished? I think that there are certainly people in that Russian regime who are thinking that the threat of um, nuclear war will become more powerful if a very small nuclear bomb is used um, against god knows what potentially even some nato territory nato infrastructure that doesn't kill any civilians so there are certainly people in the kremlin who think that that would make the nuclear threats more cogent might there be cases where Putin would think that the use of nukes would destabilize his power? Yeah. Um, it would be a catastrophic destabilization of his power if he gave a nuclear command that wasn't realized. And that might be a gray thing, because in what way would it be not realized? Would they not do it? Would they do it but not at the target he wants? Would they do it but with conventional weapons instead of nuclear weapons? Um, so presumably, depending on how that glitches, if it glitches, um, there's going to be impact on Putin's legitimacy. But Putin cannot afford to request the use of nuclear weapons if he thinks that there's an extremely high risk that the command won't go through any more questions about nuclear here um, might there be cases where Putin could think that the use of nukes might destabilize his power structure in the Kremlin yes we've we've said something about that um, I think we're kind of good for the moment um, but it's not going to happen overnight because we're still several steps of escalation away from that happening but what we've kept saying is that um, there's no reason to think that that kind of escalation isn't a risk it's just that we've got to be careful that we ourselves in the west don't um, 
make an escalation like that more likely. And that brings us back to this very difficult balance between making Ukraine win and avoiding a um, nuclear war. And these are things that can often end up pulling against each other. And it's also dangerous that we've got very, very exercised democratic populations in the West pushing their governments to go further. And there is a scenario, I don't think that's going to happen, but there is a scenario in which just sheer democratic sentiment gets people killed. Um, I don't think that's going to happen, but th there's a non-zero chance of that becoming an eventuality. So this is a difficult balance. One of the things that's really working in our favor is that China will find it completely unacceptable for Russia to use nuclear weapons, even um, on a small delimited scale. So that is a genuine hurdle for Putin, and Putin will be aware of it. And we're lucky we've got that hurdle, because if it wasn't in place, then Putin may have been altogether ready to um, explore these options um, sooner. I want to make a comment about this comment that raises the issue of the passivity of the Russian people. I don't want to make it as a, a criticism of this comment. It's just a footnote to this comment. And I think what's very important to realize is that the Russian people do not have a contract with the government. You're going to do this and that, we're going to do that and this, and then it's all going to add up. No. But they do have some kind of um, an unstable but definitely present deal. And the deal is something like, look, um, as long as you're alive and you're able to work and function and subsist, you don't have any right to come to us, the government, and complain that you don't like wars we're doing or that you don't f like policies we're enacting. Um, because we'll tell you, are you working? Are you alive? Do you have a place to live? Are you eating? If yes, go away. The rest is none of your business. You know, I'm going to make sure that you basically subsist. I'm also going to try to make sure that nobody's going to kill you and Beyond that, this is really not up to you. And the deal is accepted by the citizenry. So it's important not to see this just as a kind of a top-down imposition. Um, a lot of Russians would feel, well, okay, I'm going to outsource. We've said this 75 times already in this video. We're going to outsource politics to you, but you, you've got to protect us in this very, very minimal way, and then the deal holds. Are there points of failure in this deal where the Russian people say, whoa, 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 the regime now is not, is not complying with this rough deal we've made? And what would be the reaction of the Russian people if these points of failure appeared? Um, some people might argue that the sanctions could be a point of failure because they will eventually radically change Russian society, the Russian economy. Um, I suspect that the sanctions won't create a situation where Russian population feels that deal is broken. But mass mobilization could create that kind of a feeling quite easily, which is why it would be such a risky move for Putin to not do it partially, incrementally, pointillistically. I also think that Putin using nuclear weapons might do this because a lot of Russians would feel, well, we didn't sign up to this um, and we certainly didn't sign up to the consequences of this for us, whatever they're going to be, which depends on the further patterns of escalation that follow. So there is this kind of very precarious deal. It's way short of being a contract, but it's some kind of a deal. And then there are questions that are very interesting for us about, well, at what point do the Russian people feel the deal has been broken? A couple of personal questions. Um, would you mind making a video about yourself, your background, education, your life in general? I'll do that. Could you tell us more about your personal life, how your illness has shaped who you are today, personally and professionally? If you could wave a magic wand and arrange it so that the illness never happened, would you? Yes, of course, in a second. 
in a second. Um, so the things that are the most important things in my life outside of humans I love um, are philosophy and classical music. And I am a philosopher to the bone. It's not a choice being a philosopher. Um, the German filmmaker who lives in California, Werner Herzog, says that he experiences this business of filmmaking as a kind of home invasion. Um, and that it's not that he goes toward film, it's just film breaks into his house and he has to deal with it as 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 a reality that he, 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 he simply faces. But then he says um, that it's also the case that he happens to feel very confident when there is a home invasion. He happens to feel that he can really handle this better than others and so that becomes his mission. So I would say that philosophy comes to me rather than me going to it. And it's a combination of curiosity and unconsciousness of my own powers. I think that philosophy, especially moral philosophy, is a very, very cruel profession. Um, and more than in other, any other area of philosophy, you can really waste your life. If you make some bad intellectual decisions, um, let's say at the time you're doing a doctorate, which will often be in your 20s, um, and you take a particular kind of direction and you you build on that direction and go further and further into it, your whole life could be, your whole professional life could be written off if that original choice of path, path was a mistake. So it's a, it's a fascinating subject um, and it's a cruel subject. It's a cruel subject because... Um, Cleverness guarantees nothing in moral philosophy. Uh, being clever doesn't guarantee you're going to be any good at it at all. Um, the way it does guarantee if you're a philosopher of logic. If you're a philosopher of logic and you're super clever, there's going to be a minimal level of adequacy to the work you do. But as a moral philosopher, you could conceivably do a very good job of building the wrong kind of building in the wrong kind of place, and that would not be good. Um, I think that my illness didn't change who I am, but it took me time to react to the illness as um, a case of life giving me something I didn't ask for. I mean, there was a period of a few years when I couldn't walk, couldn't talk, couldn't read. Um, when I first got ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis, when I was a postgrad student in Oxford in 2003 or so. And I wasn't ready for that and you imagine a, a young male especially a few years into their 20s um, they're not going to be ready for a challenge like that and in some ways being a complex male doesn't speed up but actually slows down your development because there's more that you've got to balance and I think that in the first um year in particular, I was terrified. And I was terrified above all, not because of the physical suffering and not because of the disability that I couldn't, you know, walk, but because of the cognitive challenge. Um, it's the weirdest thing for a philosopher to have their brain stop working. And for a young boy, that's terrifying. And overwhelming and intimidating because you're uncertain what's going to happen next. 
And even at that age, I was arrogant and I felt that my professional contribution would be important enough such that it would be a loss to the subject, not just to me, if I couldn't act out my career. Um, I learned to feel something very special about having experiences of physical suffering or being delimited in what I can do. Um, and that's that I learned to be fulfilled not just by um, doing things in the world, by participating in the world, but also just by witnessing the world. When Beethoven was very, very young, a teenager, before he ran into his health problems, and he ran into a lot of health problems, um, he had this extraordinary sense of access, which was very much predicated on the capacity to feel joy about being in the world, whether you were participating in, in it or not. And that helped Beethoven later on um, not kill himself, really, when he ran into difficult health problems and, above all, going deaf. So, I felt this sense of joy deeply when I couldn't move much. That was remarkable. Um, I think there's something really wrong and unhealthy, especially in the West, where we're relatively privileged, for a young person to go through a challenge that's so big that you end up feeling that there is nothing that can come your way that would um, be a bigger problem than what you've got resources to deal with. That's a level of strength and resilience that's almost unhealthy. You know, it's it's the level of strength of somebody who is ready to die, not because they are depressed and don't want to live. The opposite. They're ready to die because that's the level of resilience they have. Um, I think that I reacted to my illness very rigidly at first. I just wanted to beat it. And later, I learned to do what I'm doing now, which is that I dance with it. Don't want to get rid of it. Yes, of course I want to get rid of it. And I am lucky to be in good medical hands, and I'm still hoping that further progress happens. At the moment, in my better moments, I can do pretty much everything except sport. And in my better moments, if you go for dinner with me, you will not realize that I have a health issue. But the problem is that these better moments don't represent my day as a whole. And recently, I have been a little bit less good than I usually am in the last year or two. And that's partly because um, people with my kind of neuroimmune challenge often don't do well with very immunogenic interventions. And of course, that's what vaccinations are. Um, so that's been part of my story for now over a year. Um, and that means that I probably in the last year have been losing more hours than is typical for me. I've been losing often three quarters of the hours in a functional day, which means I'm extremely fast. Um, and, um, you know, whenever I do consulting, whenever I do philosophy, whenever I do YouTube videos, um, I have to squeeze a, um, a lot into a very short time frame. And of course, I'm doing everything in my power to create some kind of a chance that I'm going to have many hours in the day. And I'm not close to the possibility that at some point I could have, with medical progress, all the hours in the day. That's just not the case now. Um, and it's radically altered my, um, the timing at least, of my philosophical contribution, because there are probably about seven or 11 people in the world who are aware of the contribution that I'm building that's not been released into the world yet. Um, but that's all for now. And if I didn't have the health issue, I'd probably be to a good degree well known in my field. And um, 
I'm lucky enough that I have people, colleagues, who have a, a sort of a fairly accurate picture of wh where I would have been at without these limitations, and they're able to be to honor that and acknowledge it and support me bridging the gap as, as much as I can. Um, so that's a little bit about my career and the health history. Um, and if I were to say a bit more about philosophy, um, in philosophy, my short-term projects are about the political concept of freedom. But my longer term projects are all about moral psychology. So what is going on in you when you feel ethical emotions, um, including shame or guilt? Um, and to the side of this, I am engaged in some musicological work, which is really about what it means to bring into the world and sound out a composition that was written by Mozart, let's say, in 1777. What's it like to bring it to life today? What are the requirements involved? What kind of a process is it? What are the constraints involved? Is it still the same thing as it was in 1777 when we're looking at it today and so on? So that's a little bit about me. And finally, um, a quick housekeeping um, announcement. Um, you keep asking the questions, I'll keep answering them. I'm still committed to getting back to questions that I haven't found my way to that have been asked a few weeks ago. Um, so I'm on that, uh, but I'm slow. Second announcement, if you are emailing me um, and you feel the email is important, email me two or three times um, because I'm a little bit behind and I sometimes don't dig things out quickly enough out of the um, spam fol folder. And then for um, the Patreon supporters, at this stage, we are few um, enough for um, all of your questions to be um, with 100% certainty um, answered by me and you're welcome to submit them either on Patreon or even in the YouTube comments. I'm still going to find them. And um, I look forward to this journey going forward. And I thank you for it very, very much. I turned 41 yesterday. No, the day before yesterday. And I raised the glass to all of you who are joining this conversation um, on the YouTube channel. And um, I was wishing you health and um, well-being and um, I had the sense that I'm beginning a conversation here to which I'm committed to for life and I have the greatest enthusiasm and curiosity to see where it takes us. Lots of love, Tuxun.